I'm shocked. I didn't think anybody was interested in Abraham Lincoln at all. I'm surprised anyone showed up to this. I thought I might be talking to an empty room. So, When you're talking about somebody that had as much of an impact on history as Abraham Lincoln, um, you know, there's really only so much you can do in 45 minutes or so. So this is a very quick, very cursory look at Lincoln's life. I'm really just trying to hit some of the high points here for you from really from birth to death. So, and as you can imagine with somebody like Lincoln, there's a lot of high points. So um, this is a very quick look at his life. Um, so if you have some philosophical, you know, questions about Lincoln and his use of power and this kind of stuff, I'm happy to take questions at the end. Um, but uh, again, it is a very quick sort of overview of, of Lincoln's life. Um, it is not a, a deep dive on, you know, Lincoln and, you know, civil liberties or Lincoln and slavery or any of that kind of stuff. We'll hit on those topics, but, but it's just a very quick look at, at who Lincoln was. And of course, obviously, today is a great day to do this program because, of course, today is Lincoln's 211th birthday. He was born February 12th of 1809. This has nothing to do with the program, but interestingly enough, did you know Charles Darwin was born on the exact same day? So Lincoln and Darwin were born not just on the same date, the same day, February 12th, 1809. So two of the most important figures really in human history, I think, uh, and they're both born on the same day. So I'd say February 12th, 1809 was a pretty good day for, uh, for humanity. So, um, so we're going to, again, go through the slides, talk a little bit about Lincoln. Again, just hit some of the high points of his life, his career, uh, the Civil War, that kind of thing. And then at the end, if you have questions, I'll be happy to take questions. And if you want recommendations on some books to read uh, and some other places you can find information uh, you know that is a little bit deeper and more involved about Lincoln I'm happy to make those recommendations as well and I would ask because we have a big group today which is a great thing uh, if you do have questions just hold on to those till the end so we can get through this because some people may have to get back to work not me of course I mean I'm here at your disposal that's what I'm here for but uh, but if some people may have to get back to work or have other places to go so let's talk about the life of the man who signed his name a. Lincoln. So Lincoln's born, as I said, February 12th, 1809, near Hodgenville in Kentucky. That's Hardin County, which is right here. I probably have a pointer here, don't I? Yeah. That blue county right there, Hardin County, Kentucky. Uh, and his parents are Thomas and Nancy Lincoln. Nancy Lincoln's maiden name is Hanks. I've had people ask me on Facebook, was she related to Tom Hanks, the actor? I have no idea. I have no idea. Uh, maybe she was, maybe she wasn't. I have no idea. But at any rate, um, uh, Lincoln's parents were, uh, were Thomas and, uh, and Nancy Lincoln. And again, it's interesting that Lincoln is, in fact, born in the South. And here's another interesting little tidbit. He's born about 100 miles from Jefferson Davis. So Jefferson Davis is also born in Kentucky. Davis, you know, we... We famously associate with Mississippi. That was his adopted home state. Just as we famously associate Lincoln with Illinois, that was also his adopted home state. So Lincoln, in fact, is born not in Illinois, but in Kentucky. His uh, ancestry was mostly English. His, uh, his grandfather, whose name was also Abraham Lincoln, was in fact killed in an, in an Indian attack in 1786. Uh, and this was uh, uh, in Kentucky, and not really too long after they had left Virginia. So Lincoln does have a lot of sort of southern uh, ancestry and, and southern uh, stock that he comes from. Uh, so his grandfather's name is Abraham Lincoln. And I should also mention that in that Indian attack, which took place in 1786 that killed his grandfather. His father, Thomas Lincoln, who was about four years old at the time, was actually there and witnessed the whole thing. How much of that he internalized at only four years old, I don't know, but we do know for a fact Thomas Lincoln was there uh, when his, his father was killed in, in, in this Indian attack in 1786. So um, in 1811, when Abraham Lincoln was two years old, his family left Kentucky, and there were a couple of reasons for this. Um, and as Lincoln says here, uh, oh, I'm sorry, this is, uh, this is Lincoln talking about the Knob Creek Farm. Um, this is a, a different farm in Kentucky that the Lincolns went to before they left. Uh, they left Kentucky. I'm getting ahead of myself. I apologize. So uh, land disputes were not uncommon at all in Kentucky at this point. Uh, and really a lot of the original, uh, the original states, the original 13 plus states that had been added shortly after the Revolutionary War, places like Vermont and Kentucky, uh, had a lot of issues with surveys. 
this is, you know, this is before the rectangular survey system was put into place, which was co-authored by Thomas Jefferson. Uh, and so surveys at this point were done, you know, kind of that, oh, you know, go 20 paces past the oak tree and then make a left and then go 27 paces to the creek. And that's how these surveys were done. So as you can imagine, uh, surveys were just absolutely rife with, with lawsuits and, and disputes because of how imperfect this system was. That's really the genius of the rectangular survey system that, that came along shortly thereafter that was, as I said, co-authored by none other than Thomas Jefferson. So finally in December of 1816, so Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln at this point is about seven years old, the Lincolns leave Kentucky and move to Indiana. So a lot of people don't realize that in, uh, Lincoln didn't, uh, wasn't born in Illinois, didn't live his whole life in Illinois, and in fact had a, a, a multi-year stop in Indiana before moving to, uh, to Illinois, which is where we most famously think of him as, as being from. So Link, Thomas Lincoln leaves Kentucky uh, and goes to Spencer County, Indiana. And Spencer is right down here at the bottom, if I can find it, right there, that Orange County right there. So we're just barely into Indiana here. This, of course, over here is still Kentucky. So the Lincolns leave Kentucky and go to extreme southern Indiana. So as Lincoln says here, there were a couple of reasons for this move. Uh, one, of course, is, is the issue of slavery. Thomas Lincoln was illiterate. His father, Thomas Lincoln, was illiterate. Um, you know, didn't know how to read and write, but he was uh, philosophically and morally opposed to slavery, which of course did exist in the state of Kentucky. Um, but the main reason, you know, slavery is a reason, but the main reason really that the Lincolns left Kentucky to go to Indiana was because of all of these land disputes. Uh, Thomas Lincoln at one point had, you know, had been, had been sued and, and had lost his case and then the case was reversed. And so, you know, he, he had all these issues with these lands, these crazy land surveys that were done in Kentucky and finally uh, threw up his hands and just sort of said, we're done with Kentucky and, and took his family into, uh, again, to uh, Spencer County, Indiana here in the extreme southern part of, uh, of Indiana. So again, slavery is part of the reason, but really the main reason is just the difficulty of, of getting clear and free title to land in, in a place like Kentucky with those crazy surveys. This is uh, Thomas Lincoln, one of the few photos we have of Thomas Lincoln, uh, Abraham Lincoln's father. Not a great relationship between these two. Um, you know, Thomas Lincoln, as I said, was illiterate. He was a very sort of stern, hard man. Um, he thought education was a waste of time. And, you know, he, he, you know, he worked the land. He worked the land with his hands, and that's what he expected his son to do. And, of course, his son didn't want to do that. Um, you know, his son did certainly plenty of that type of labor as a young man. Uh, and the more he did it, the more he realized this isn't what he wanted to do with his life. And probably a lot of people that have done manual labor probably think, you know, that's all the more reason to, to, to try to, you know, get an education or take advantage of whatever opportunities you can so you don't have to do that your whole life. Not that there's anything wrong with it, there, uh, but certainly uh, Abraham Lincoln did not want to be, uh, you know, a dirt farmer his whole life like his father was. Uh, Lincoln, of course, had great respect for, for farming and for farmers, and he, he shared that many, many times, including when he, was, when he was president, you know, he understood the value of agriculture and, and was very appreciative of people who did work the land, but it wasn't something he personally himself really wanted to do. He did it as a young man because he had to, because he lived with his father and that was expected, but he did, uh, he did have, have his, uh, his sights set on, on, uh, on higher goals than that. <clears throat> Uh, so as far as life in southern Indiana on really a brand new tract of land, uh, it was very, very hard life, you know, clearing trees, building a house, hunting, farming, um, you know, there was just nonstop labor all the time. And again, this is where uh, as a young man and coming into his teen years, Abraham Lincoln is, is learning more and more about what he doesn't want to do with his life. And he doesn't want to be like his, like his dad. And that really did, as I said, cause some, some uh, rough, rough patches in their relationship. They didn't get along that well. Uh, Thomas Lincoln didn't understand his son's desire to learn and to be educated. Uh, and then conversely, Abraham Lincoln didn't understand his father's, you know, uh, desire to just stay where he was and, and not progress or learn or uh, anything like that. So the, the relationship was, was not great. And in fact, when Thomas Lincoln finally died, which was, um, you know, in the probably the 1840s or 50s, I guess, uh, Abraham Lincoln didn't even go to the funeral. Um, he just, you know, they just had a very sort of uh, contentious relationship. And there's actually been some pretty interesting scholarship that shows that this was really not that uncommon. 
you know, everybody hears, oh, you know, Abraham Lincoln didn't go to his dad's funeral. And then uh, there's been some really interesting scholarship that shows uh, that was actually fairly common, uh, especially among people who wanted to do other things and, and kind of had these bad relationships with, with parents because the parents didn't want them to do those other things. So it really was not all that uncommon. So Lincoln is very much a, you know, a man of his, of his era there in, in that respect. In October of 1818, uh, Abraham Lincoln is almost 10 years old at this point. Uh, his mother, the possible relative of Tom Hanks, uh, <laughs> dies uh, in her early 30s. Uh, she dies of what's called milk sickness. Um, basically, this is, again, in southern Indiana. There was a, uh, a root that was called, I believe, snake root, something like that, um, that cows ate. And, and as they ingested it, it infected the milk. And uh, it was toxic to, to human beings. And so uh, Nancy Lincoln died of what they called milk sickness, drinking the milk of these cows that had eaten this uh, this uh, snake root. So she is, uh, again, uh, in her early 30s. Abraham Lincoln is not quite 10 years old when she dies, so now he's left without, uh, without a mother. This is one of the many, many similarities we have between Abraham Lincoln and James Garfield, who we talk about down the street. They both lost a parent very, very early in life. In James Garfield's case, he was about a year and a half old when his father died. Uh, in, in Abraham Lincoln's case, he's not quite 10 when his mother dies. Uh, and as you can see, Abraham Lincoln had fond memories of his mother and at one point says, all that I am or ever hope to be, I owe to her. Thomas Lincoln did remarry uh, relatively quickly. Again, not really all that uncommon, um, especially when you consider Thomas Lincoln is now a man who has two children, you know, because Abraham Lincoln had an older sister, uh, and he needs someone there that can care for the children and keep the home and cook and do all of these things. It's not at all, you know, we, we especially now that it's almost Valentine's Day, you know, we tend to think of our modern conception of romantic love and, and all this stuff, which is all great. Um, but for a lot of people, especially on the American frontier, you know, marriage was something of a business relationship. You know, uh, the man provides labor and provides uh, resources and the woman provides the children and, and cares for the children. So it's a very, you know, kind of business type relationship. So Thomas Lincoln realizes after the death of his wife, he needs uh, a woman in the home, he needs help. And so he marries a, a family friend uh, who's from back in Kentucky who was a widower. So her husband, her first husband had died. Uh, and uh, Sarah Bush Johnston is her name. And uh, so she moves to Indiana to the Lincoln home uh, and, and with her three children uh, of her own. And uh, the Lincolns now have a new sort of blended, uh, blended family. And Abraham Lincoln, even though he didn't have a great relationship with his father, did end up having a very, very close relationship with his stepmother. So he had fond memories of his, of his natural mother who died when he was young. And then he had this wonderful relationship with his, uh, his stepmother as well. And by the way, she lived long enough to see him elected president. So she did live a very long, long life. <clears throat> So there's that great old sort of wives tale about, uh, you know, Lincoln didn't have much education and he didn't have a year of school in his entire life. Well, believe it or not, this is one of the things Hollywood actually gets right. I know we talk a lot about the things Hollywood gets wrong. In this case, they're right. Lincoln really didn't have an aggregate of one year in his entire, of education in his entire life. Now, it's hard to consider that, you know, a time when somebody who, uh, didn't ever practically go to school, could be elected president. Uh, obviously, that you know, Harry Truman is the last uh, president that did not have a college degree, um, and I don't know that we'll ever see another one that without a college education. But uh, but in this case, uh, Lincoln, in fact, did only have that you know one year or less of of schooling for his entire life. Again, not that uncommon. Uh, what's uncommon here really is the fact that Lincoln rose to the heights that he did. Um, with so little formal education, but the fact that he had so little education was, was very, very common on the American frontier. School was not the priority. School was a luxury. It was something you did when, when there was nothing else to be, that needed to be done. Uh, and so Lincoln really was so busy with uh, helping his father on the farm and clearing those trees and planting crops and harvesting crops and building fences and caring for livestock. There was really no time for him to go to school. So this is actually, a, it's a long quote, I'm not going to read it, you all know how to read, but um, this is actually Lincoln writing about himself. 
this was common practice at the time uh, when, that uh, when presidential candidates were nominated, they would actually write a short autobiography just to introduce themselves to the American people. Again, keep in mind, Lincoln's running for, for office in a time when, you know, they're you couldn't go on Twitter and follow him or, you know, follow his Instagram or any of that stuff or, or see him on CNN or wherever. There were really only a few ways, and this is true even as far forward as 1880 when James Garfield is running right down the, right down the street, that, um, you know, there's really only a few ways people can really get to know candidates, and one of them is reading about them in the newspapers. And so Lincoln and many other candidates of that era would write an autobiography, just talking about, uh, about who they were and what their background was and what else they had done, just kind of introducing themselves to people. So this is a rather lengthy quote here that Lincoln wrote about himself uh, in one of those campaign autobiographies that he wrote in 1860 when he was the Republican nominee for President of the United States. Uh, he regrets his want of education and does what he can to supply the want. So we have that great old story about, you know, Lincoln borrowing books from people, from anybody he could, and walking miles and miles to get books, and reading the Bible, you know, one for religious instruction, but two just because he wanted to read and learn how to pronounce words. Uh, and build his vocabulary. So these are all things about Lincoln that we know are actually true. So sometimes the, uh, the old wives' tales actually have some truth to them, and in this case, they definitely do. Uh, so again, Lincoln spends his, uh, his early life primarily in southern Indiana. In 1828, when he is uh, uh, eight or 19 years old, I guess, um, he uh, makes a trip to New Orleans. He's hired to pilot a flatboat down the Mississippi River. Uh, all the way to New Orleans, and uh, a friend named, uh, named Alan Gentry went with him. And this was really the first exposure that we know of that Lincoln had to slavery. Um, you know, keep in mind, he's from Indiana. Um, he lives on the frontier. You know, he doesn't live around a, a lot of people. He certainly doesn't, doesn't live near any big cities or anything like that. So his, his interactions with people in general are, are fairly... Uh, fairly limited people other than his family and, and immediate neighbors. Um, so he's not really that familiar with, with African Americans and certainly not with, with the institution of slavery. But this was a really sort of um, key moment in Lincoln's life when he went to New Orleans on this, piloted this flatboat to New Orleans, and then while he and Alan Gentry were there in the city basically waiting to, to go back north, they saw a, a slave auction take place. And, you know, Lincoln shared with Alan Gentry how disturbing he found this whole thing and, and how, how bothered he was by it. And so Alan Gentry later recalled, you know, when Lincoln was, was much more famous than he was in 1828, that this whole thing had really bothered him and was something that disturbed him. So, you know, we kind of see maybe some early glimpses of Lincoln's view on, uh, on, on humanity, on equal rights, however you want to, uh, however you want to put it. Uh, in January of 1828, the same year that Lincoln went to New Orleans, uh, his older sister died in childbirth. Uh, again, another very, very common occurrence uh, in, in early America and certainly on the frontier. Uh, she was 21 years old, so she was very young, and she died in, uh, in childbirth, which was not at all uncommon. Uh, and so uh, a family member remembered that she could, like her brother, meet and greet a person with the kindest greeting in the world, make you easy at the touch of a word, an intellectual and intelligent woman. Um, so at this point, when he's about uh, not quite 19 years old, uh, Abraham Lincoln is now an only child because uh, she was his only sister. Uh, and she dies at, at age 21, uh, and so now Abraham Lincoln has lost his mother and now his, his only sibling, his sister, uh, before he's 19 years old. <clears throat> In 1830, uh, the Lincolns decided to move one more time. This time they were leaving southern Indiana, which is down here, and they were going up into central Illinois. And this was primarily because of the availability of land in, in Illinois. Uh, Lincoln at this point, Abraham Lincoln is 21 years old and really kind of has this struggle. Should he go with his family to Illinois? Should he stay in Indiana? He wasn't quite sure really what he wanted to do uh, and then finally decided he felt obligated, even though he didn't really want to, he felt obligated to go on to Illinois with the family. Uh, and so he goes along with the family. Uh, helps Thomas Lincoln and, and Sarah Bush Johnston Lincoln, his stepmother, and the rest of the family get settled here uh, in central Illinois and then, uh, you know, near, uh, near Decatur. And then uh, within about a year or so, he leaves and then moves on to, uh, to live on his own uh, about 40 miles away in a town called New Salem. And uh, New Salem 
you know, frankly, doesn't last that long. Uh, it's been kind of rebuilt now as a tourist attraction because Lincoln once lived there. Um, so you can go to New Salem now, but uh, the town itself really didn't last all that long. This is where Lincoln is first uh, exposed to politics. And uh, Lincoln, even though, again, he has very little formal education, he's obviously smart, he's obviously well-read at this point, and uh, people are drawn to him. He has a, you know, a, a very sort of fun personality, and uh, even though we tend to think of him later in life as very depressed and morose and all this stuff, he actually was a very sort of, at this point in his life as a young man, a very sort of fun, uh, fun guy to be around, and so people were drawn to him. And uh, so he moves to New Salem, establishes himself, becomes a, a storekeeper for a while, which is something he would also do later in Springfield, uh, and uh, decides to enter politics. He's a Whig, and of course the Whig party didn't, didn't, didn't last uh, past the, uh, the 1850s, but at this point, we're talking uh, early 1830s here, Lincoln is a Whig. So at this point in American history, the Democratic Party of sort of Andrew Jackson and people like that is kind of considered the, uh, the, the conservative party, the, uh, the party that wants you know, smaller government, they don't want as much government intervention in their lives. The Whig party, is more um, interested in, in the government promoting what they called internal improvements, canals and roads and things like this. Um, so they would be think, thought of as maybe more progressive or more liberal if you want to use a, a modern term, which we need to be careful with using modern terms to apply to people that lived almost 200 years ago. But at any rate, uh, Lincoln uh, is a Whig. And so he's opposed to Andrew Jackson. He his, his political hero is Henry Clay, who's the, uh, the, you know, the longtime Speaker of the House and then a senator from, uh, from his home state of Kentucky. So Lincoln decides to run for the Illinois legislature and, as a Whig. And then he has his, uh, his one little bit of military experience, which is during the Black Hawk War. This is an Indian conflict in, in central Illinois. Uh, Lincoln joins a, a local militia unit, and this is the era when members of units were able to elect their own officers. You didn't need, necessarily need a, you know, a, an officer's commission from West Point or, or anything like that. Uh, the, the men of a, of, a, of a unit could elect their own officers, and in this case, they, uh, they elected Abraham Lincoln as the captain of the, this 31st uh, Illinois Militia Regiment. And Lincoln said later that this was the greatest honor of his life. Uh, that you know, he he had, all he cared about was being held in, in high esteem by his by his uh, his fellow soldiers, and in this case, obviously, they elected him captain, so they they thought very highly of him. Uh, during this battle, Lincoln wrote this this long, very humorous passage at one point where he talked about all of the battle that they saw, and then of course at the end, you realize he's talking about mosquitoes, not Indians. <laughs> so. <laughs> So it's kind of like, you know, Robert E. Lee wrote a great passage one time about this very intense battle he had. This is before the Civil War, and you realize he was in Texas and he was talking about a rattlesnake. Uh, so um, Lincoln, you know, they never, they never really have any actual combat or anything like that. The war doesn't, doesn't really uh, spread that far, and it, it, it's over within a few months. So Lincoln really, uh, the bulk of his actual military service is really just a few months. I think it was like a 90-day you know, commitment or something like that. But again, very formative experience in his life, not because of you know, the, you know, the, all of the battle that they saw, because clearly they didn't see any, but because of that feeling he had of being elected and being, you know, feeling proud of his own accomplishments and that people had chosen him for a, for a position. So I think uh, that really affected him in a positive way, and he, he definitely wanted more of that uh, as, he, as, he moved, uh, as he moved forward in his life. So after the Black Hawk War, he comes back to New Salem. He, he does run for the legislature. He doesn't win. Abraham Lincoln lost a lot more elections than he won. Uh, and that's one of the things, you know, we're, we're so used today to, to following modern politics and, you know, people who kind of are really uh, hold up their own records. They've never lost an election. Well, that certainly does not apply to Abraham Lincoln. I mean, he lost a lot more elections than he ever won. And I think that that was part of the formative experience that he needed to really become the, the person and the president that, that he became. Uh, but at any rate, uh, Lincoln does not win election to the legislature. He goes back and invests what little money he has in, in the store. Uh, he becomes a land surveyor. He does that for a while. He does eventually get elected to the Illinois legislature in 1834, so he's 29, or, uh, 25 years old at this point. 
um, decides to study law. Again, it's a, a different era in history. You didn't have to go to a law school. You just apprenticed with another uh, attorney who would train you for a number of years until you were knowledgeable enough to pass the bar. Uh, and so Lincoln decides to study law. Um, and that was at the insistence of a guy named John Stewart, who, uh, who had a, a cousin in Lexington, Kentucky, who would end up playing a pretty important uh, role in Lincoln's life. Uh, Lincoln is returned to the legislature, reelected in, in, in the next several uh, successive elections, um, and then was uh, left that, left that, uh, that uh, the legislature after several terms and then didn't go back really into elective office until, until the mid-1850s. So it wasn't until 1837 that Lincoln moved to Springfield, which is the town that we normally think of as his hometown and the town where he lived really at this point for the rest of his life up until becoming president of the United States. So, but it wasn't until 1837 when he's, he's going on 28 years old that he finally moves to uh, that he finally moves to, uh, to Springfield. So this is Mary Todd. Again, I mentioned her a second ago as the cousin of the guy who sort of convinced Lincoln to study law and become an attorney. Um, Mary, Todd, Mary Todd is from Kentucky, like Lincoln, uh, and she is from a wealthy family. She grows up with, you know, surrounded by, by slaves and servants uh, in a very wealthy family. And she has a sister who has at some point moved to Springfield with her husband. So Mary Todd visits Springfield regularly and, you know, it's, again, it's not like today when, you know, you can drive somewhere in a few hours and you stay a few days and then you go home. If you go visit in this area, you stay for a while. So she would go to Springfield for sometimes, you know, months at a time and stay with her sister. So at some point she meets Abraham Lincoln and they start this relationship and it's kind of, again, another, some other similarities to the Garfields here, you know, the, the, the early part of this relationship is somewhat rocky. Uh, you know, Lincoln is, is, uh, is sort of trying to tell her how she feel, how he feels, and she's not as uh, reciprocating as much as he would like. Then they decide to get engaged at one point, and then he starts to worry he's not good enough for her, and, uh, and he breaks off the engagement. And so she's devastated, of course, and then later they reconcile and they get engaged again. Uh, and, you know, Lincoln at one point described himself as the most miserable, miserable man living because he had broken off this engagement and he wanted to be with her, but he, was a, he had all of this self-doubt that he wasn't good enough for her. And, uh, and so eventually they reconcile and they get engaged and they finally do get married on November 4th of 1842. And I love this quote here that he wrote in a letter to a friend. Nothing new here except my marriage, my marrying, which to me is a matter of profound wonder. And uh, I think there's probably a lot of us in here that feel like we probably did a little better than we were supposed to when we got married. <laughs> Certainly I did. Uh, and so, I, you know, I love that quote because it reminds me of, of my own wife all the time that, you know, I still can't figure it out, but uh, thank God I fooled her. <clears throat> so uh, they move, again, they're living, uh, they, they make their home in, in Springfield. Uh, their very first child is Robert Lincoln, born uh, August 1st, 1843, so really almost exactly nine months after their, uh, their marriage, uh, they, uh, they have their first child. And then they buy this house uh, in Springfield uh, in May of 1844. Uh, you know, they're obviously expecting to have more children and their family's going to be growing. Lincoln at this point is starting to have some success as an attorney, so he's got some money. Uh, and they buy this. Uh, they buy this. They buy this house. If you go to Springfield, Illinois today, and you want to visit Lincoln Home National Historic Site, which is run by the wonderful people of the National Park Service, I would say this is maybe possibly the second best presidential site in all of the National Park Service. Uh, just seeing who's listening. <laughs> Uh, this is the house you go to. This is now Lincoln Home National Historic Site. So this is the home the Lincolns owned. I mean, well, actually owned even after Lincoln's death. Uh, this is the home that they lived in for the rest of their life together until they went to the White House. And then Mary Lincoln did continue to own this home uh, after President Lincoln was, uh, was killed. So, uh, so there's the home that is now Lincoln Home National Historic Site. And then here's uh, a young picture of a uh, young Robert Lincoln, who does, of course, play a very important role in James Garfield's life, too. <clears throat> Uh, Lincoln, uh, again, starts practicing law in 1841, the year before he marries uh, Mary. And uh, so he practices with Stephen Logan for a while, then William Herndon. 
uh, and becomes really a, a very, very quickly becomes a very popular and very sought after and very well paid uh, attorney. So uh, he starts, uh, you know, he tries a lot of cases, but he also starts, they had these judicial circuits at the time, which was something that was very common in, in areas that didn't have huge populations. Uh, you would basically sort of go on this circuit, you know, once or twice a year where you would just go to all these small towns and, uh, and work legal cases in those small towns. So Lincoln became a, a circuit rider, basically, as, as they were called. Uh, and so that's, you know, that's really important for his development in politics as well because as he's riding this circuit, he's getting to know people and his name is getting out there. And the more time he spends trying cases in front of people and making very articulate arguments, uh, be they legal arguments or, or political arguments, uh, people are starting to notice him. So he's, he's starting to build this sort of, uh, you know, this, this uh, area of support of people that really know who he is and, and, and are impressed by his, uh, by his skills. Uh, the Lincoln's second son, Edward, is born in, uh, in, in uh, March of 1846. The Garfields had an Edward as well. <clears throat> in uh, August of 1846, Lincoln is elected to the U.S. House of Representatives. He does do one term in Congress. That's another little known Lincoln fact. A lot of people aren't aware that he did actually spend one term in, in the House of Representatives in Washington. Uh, prior to becoming president, you know, 14 years later. Uh, he's still a Whig, uh, still a member of the Whig Party, which still exists at this point. Um, and, you know, the Lincolns decided that they wanted to, to move the entire family to Washington. They didn't want to be separated because congressmen would go to Washington for months on end and, you know, very often leave the families at home, in this case in Illinois. The Lincolns didn't want that. Uh, the Garfields had the same kind of situation where James Garfield would go to Congress for months and months and his wife and children were at home and, you know, they were kind of unhappy that way and then finally decided in the late 1860s they're just going to get a house in Washington and move the whole family to Washington. The Lincolns had kind of the opposite uh, experience here where they took the whole family to Washington right off the bat. They lived in a, in a boarding house basically with a bunch of other people and Mary Lincoln was miserable. And so she eventually decided that uh, she, was, uh, she was going to take the kids, uh, take the family out of D.C. He would stay there by himself to attend to his duties as a congressman. And uh, Mary and the children were going to go to Kentucky to, see, to, to stay with her family while he was uh, spending the rest, doing the rest of his, uh, his term in Congress. These terms in Congress, you know, again, today things are so different. We have members of Congress who, you know, get elected and, and stay, you know, for decades sometimes. Um, in Lincoln's era, it was not at all uncommon for, for well-known people in an area to just kind of rotate. You know, uh, so in this case, you know, Lincoln's, Lincoln's time finally came in 1846. It was his turn to be the Whig candidate. He was elected, and so he went to Congress. And he went to Congress n knowing full well he would very likely serve the one term, and that would be it. And then he would go back to Illinois, and the next Whig in line would be elected and, and would, go to, uh, would go to Washington. So it wasn't quite like it is today where people tend to get elected and then just want to stay as long as they can. And really, you know, some of them, you know, stay for, for their whole careers. Uh, Lincoln knew very well that, you know, he was probably going to be a one-term congressman, and, and, and that was fine. The thing that really didn't sit well with him was the fact that he, he missed his wife and kids, which of course everybody can understand. Um, and here's a great, uh, a great line that he, uh, in a letter he writes to his wife, uh, when you were here I thought you hindered me some in attending to business. In other words, you and the kids are just in the way. Um, but now having nothing but business, no variety, it has grown exceedingly tasteless to me. I hate to sit down and direct documents and I hate to stay in this old room by myself. So he's very unhappy without his family. I think everybody can relate to that. Uh, and so, you know, at this point, Lincoln really starts looking forward to the end <laughs> of this two-year term in the House of Representatives so that the family can reunite and they can go back home to Springfield where they belong. Uh, Lincoln's most notable accomplishment or, or, you know, thing that he was involved with during this one term in Congress was uh, opposing the Mexican-American War. Uh, Mexican-American War was fought between 1846 and 48. So really the war is almost over, really, by the time Lincoln gets to Congress, which is in late 1847. Uh, but uh, he does make uh, one very notable speech on the floor of the House opposing the Mexican-American War and saying some not-so-kind things about President James K. Polk. And uh, when I say not-so-kind things, it's all relative to, you know, the modern era, I guess we'll say. Um, so here's Lincoln talking about Polk on the floor of the House. As I have said before, 
As I have before said, he knows not where he is. He is a bewildered, confounded, and miserably per perplexed man. God grant he may be able to show there is not something about his conscience more painful than all his mental perplexity. Pretty tame by 2020 standards, I would say. Who knows what he would have said if he'd had a Twitter account, but, but, uh, but certainly, uh, you know, this is Lincoln talking about Polk and got a lot of blowback, by the way, about this speech. People thought, it, you know, he was insulting the president and all this. But Lincoln is very much opposed to the Mexican-American War because a lot of people, especially Whigs, see the Mexican-American War as basically just a land grab and a power grab by the Democratic Party, which at this point is dominated by Southerners. So a lot of Whigs, like Lincoln, feel like, you know, the, the U.S. kind of instigated this needless war really just to acquire more territory so that slavery would have places to expand to. So Lincoln is very much opposed to the war on, on those grounds. Uh, and he's not alone in that, uh, in that, in that assessment either. Uh, John Quincy Adams you know, is, is in Congress at this point, and uh, he's actually about, uh, his, his life is just about over at this point, but he's very much opposed to this conflict. And later in life, when Ulysses S. Grant wrote his memoirs, he had some very unkind things to say about this conflict as well, basically saying, it was all a, you know, it was all what I just said. It was a land grab and a power grab by, by Southerners that were looking for places that they could take slavery to. So Lincoln's accomplishments during this single term in Congress really is this rather vocal opposition to the Mexican-American War. And interestingly enough, he also introduces a bill, which doesn't go anywhere, uh, to end slavery in the District of Columbia. Uh, and of course, that obviously plays a big role in his, uh, in his presidency much later on. And then when the term ended after two years, he was more than happy to go home to Springfield. And at that point really figured he was done with elective politics. He was gonna go home, he was gonna reunite with his wife and family, and then, uh, and then he was gonna be a, you know, a, a very well paid attorney for the rest of his life. But you know what they say about best laid plans. Uh, so uh, they, um, their son Edward dies in 1850 when he's four years old. Uh, again, more similarities here between the Lincolns and the Garfields. They both lost children, and specifically boys named Edward, uh, very, very young. The, uh, the Garfields' Edward died in, in 1876, just before he turned two. Uh, and then their, uh, their third son, William Wallace Lincoln, is born the same year, 1850. And then Thomas Tad Lincoln, the, uh, the famous Tad who, you know, you know in all the photos from when Lincoln was president wearing the, you know, the miniature Union uniform and all this kind of stuff. Uh, he's born in 1853. So that brings us into the mid-1850s. And this is the decade where what eventually became the Civil War really gets, gets, um, gets heated up. You know, the, uh, the events of the 1850s really lead us to the Civil War. And really one of the key events is right here, and this is the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854. Uh, the Kansas-Nebraska Act should be relatively benign. It's basically a, a, a piece of legislation designed to organize territories of Kansas and Nebraska. But the guy who wrote the Kansas-Nebraska Act, who happened to be a senator from Illinois, Stephen Douglas, uh, put a little provision in there that the people in these territories would be able to decide for themselves whether their, their territorial constitutions would have slavery or not have slavery, which sounds great, sounds democratic, you know, this is America, we put things to a vote, that's how we decide. Only problem is, this is the Missouri Compromise line that's been in place since 1820, and the Missouri Compromise says that basically anything north of this line, there's no slavery allowed. Anything below this line, theoretically, slavery is permitted. So Abraham Lincoln, you don't have to be a, you know, a cartographer to look at this map and say, well, Kansas and Nebraska are both north of this line. So this idea of popular sovereignty really in Lincoln's mind is illegal and improper because it opens up the possibility of slavery in Kansas and Nebraska, both of which are north of the line. This is the event that leads directly to the creation of the Republican Party. This is the event that leads Abraham Lincoln back into politics. His his deep, deep opposition to the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which again leads directly to the, the creation of the Republican Party, which is obviously gonna play a very big role in Lincoln's future. Uh, another great quote here from Lincoln on the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Equal justice to the South, it is said, requires us to consent to the extending of slavery to new countries. That is to say, inasmuch as you do not object to my taking my hog to Nebraska, therefore I must not object to you taking your slave. Now, I admit this is perfectly logical if there is no difference between hogs and Negroes. So obviously, 
Lincoln is incensed at the idea of the Kansas-Nebraska Act, incensed at what basically amounts to the repeal of the Missouri Compromise. Uh, Lincoln did not immediately abandon the Whig Party. He was hoping the Whig Party would come up with a cohesive and coherent response to the Kansas-Nebraska Act. It didn't, and then the Whig Party, which had Northern Whigs and Southern Whigs, couldn't figure out what it wanted to do about slavery and basically just ended up collapsing on itself. And many former Whigs then joined the Republican Party. So the Republican Party is founded in 1854 in response to the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Lincoln joins the Republicans finally in 1855 or early 1856, uh, you know, leaving, uh, finally leaving uh, the Whig Party behind, and the Whig Party at that point is basically dead. Uh, he, so he becomes, a, uh, he becomes a, a Republican. In 1856, the Republicans, only two years old, do actually, are actually organized enough to run a presidential candidate, and that's John C. Fremont, who's right here. He's the first Republican presidential candidate. And Lincoln actually gets some consideration for the vice presidential nomination uh, to run for vice president with John C. Fremont. Um, doesn't doesn't get it, obviously. It kind of reminds me of 1956 when the Democrats kind of flirted with John F. Kennedy as a vice presidential candidate. Uh, he didn't get it, but as everyone knows, he came back fairly strong in 1960. It's the same he thing here with Lincoln in 1860. Uh, they kind of flirt with him a little bit for, uh, for the vice presidential nomination. He doesn't get it, and, uh, and, and of course the Fremont ticket loses to James Buchanan, uh, and then James Buchanan of course famously becomes the last Democrat elected president until Grover Cleveland. Um, so, uh, so Lincoln, uh, Lincoln is now uh, firmly back into, uh, into politics and firmly in the Republican camp. Uh, he challenges Stephen Douglas, who was the author of the Kansas-Nebraska Act for his Senate seat in 1858. And this is where we get the famous Lincoln-Douglas debates. Uh, so this, is, this shows you the location of the seven debates all over the state of, uh, the state of Illinois. Um, it was uh, when he was accepting the nomination to run for the Senate prior to these debates. This was in June of 1858 when Lincoln made the very famous House Divided speech. Uh, so June 16th of 1858, he's accepting the Republican nomination to run for the Senate. And he famously says, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Uh, I do not believe this government can permanently endure half slave and half free. It must become all one thing or all the other. Uh, and of course, again, Stephen Douglas is the incumbent senator from Illinois, the author of the Kansas-Nebraska Act. I love this graphic here, really just, it shows the, you know, the very, the very different physical <laughs> appearances between the two. Douglas is very short. Uh, they called him the little giant. Uh, Lincoln is six foot four. I mean, he's the tallest president we've ever had. He's, he's, he's very tall for the, for, well, for any era, really. Uh, but uh, so, you know, there's this great physical difference between them, but obviously the, the philosophical and political differences are on display during these debates as well. Now, has anyone ever heard of Senator Abraham Lincoln? Of course not, because he didn't win, he lost. Remember what I said before, Lincoln lost way more elections than he ever won. He did not win against Stephen Douglas, he lost. Who was Lincoln and Douglas too, really trying to appeal to in that 1858 election? The people of Illinois are not electing their own senators at this point. Senators are elected under the Constitution until it's, it's changed in the early 20th century. Senators are elected by state legislatures. So if the state legislature is dominated by Democrats at this point, obviously Stephen Douglas is going to be reelected. And that's exactly what happens. So Lincoln is really out there knowing he's fighting a losing battle uh, and really, you know, kind of sacrifice, you know, holding himself up as kind of a sacrificial lamb, just trying to get the message out about why the Kansas-Nebraska Act is wrong. Um, here's Lincoln during one of the debates. I think the authors of the Declaration of Independence intended to include all men, but they did not mean to declare all men equal in all respects. They did not mean to say all men were equal in color, size, intellect, moral development, or social capacity. They defined with tolerable distinctness in what they did consider all men created equal. Equal in certain unalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So Lincoln's political philosophy, which is really taking shape here in 1858, is not based on the US Constitution. It's based on the Declaration of Independence. Those are our two foundational documents. And uh, of the two, Lincoln actually looked more to the Declaration at this point for inspiration than he did to the Constitution. <clears throat> in 
in, so again, he loses that election. Uh, I think we can all agree for history's sake, it's probably good that he did. <laughs> Had he gone to the Senate in 1858, who knows what would have happened in 1860. Who knows who would have been elected? Who knows if Southern states would have decided they needed to secede? Who knows about all of these, these unknowable things? What Lincoln got out of that election was not a Senate seat, but he got national exposure. People outside Illinois are reading the transcripts of these debates in their newspapers all over the country, and they're starting to realize who this guy is and the fact that he's a very passionate and articulate and intelligent voice on a lot of these issues. So people who are Republicans or are leaning Republican at this point uh, are people who maybe are interested in what Abraham Lincoln has to say. He's invited to New York City in early 1860. Uh, and delivers a very famous speech at, uh, at Cooper Union. And a lot of people have argued, a lot of historians have argued, this is really the speech that made him, if not president, then somebody who was acceptable and, 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 and viewed as potential presidential material. Uh, wrong as we think slavery is, we can yet afford to let it alone where it is. So he's saying we're not going to attack slavery in the South. Constitutionally, as much as we might hate it, it's allowed to be there. What we don't think it's allowed to do is expand. So Lincoln is saying, and says it several times during the campaign, and even in his inaugural address in 1861, telling the South, we're not planning to do, we're not coming for your slaves. We're just saying you have to keep them where they are. You can't take them to new, to new states and territories. Wrong as we think slavery is, we can yet afford to let it alone where it is. Can we, while our votes will prevent it, allow it to spread into the national territories and to overrun us here in the free states? Let us have faith that right makes might, and in that faith, let us, to the end, dare to do our duty as we understand it. Probably the most famous line from that speech. This is the speech that make, makes people stand up and really pay attention to Abraham Lincoln. And, of course, it gets him uh, a lot of na more national exposure and makes him a potential Republican presidential candidate in 1860. So as the Republicans go into their convention in 1860 in Chicago, uh, you know, Lincoln is basically... Uh, hoping to be everyone's second choice. Uh, or as he put it, puts it, you know, if they fall out of love with their first love, maybe they'll come to me. <laughs> something, I'm paraphrasing, but it's something along those lines. Uh, so, you know, Lincoln is trying to basically be the second choice. And the reason he's trying to be the second choice is because he knows that the first choice probably cannot be nominated, and that's William Henry Seward from New York. Seward is, uh, is known as, and has been known for decades at this point, as a very, very vocal abolitionist. Not all Republicans are abolitionists at this point, folks. In fact, a lot of them are not. They are people who do not want to see the expansion of slavery, but they are not necessarily people who feel like slavery should be abolished in the South. Uh, and they are certainly not people who think African Americans should be on an equal uh, social or political standing with white people. Um, and in fact, you know, at this point, Lincoln is probably one of those people. He's, does, he's not necessarily saying, you know, the black man is the equal to the white man. He's just saying we don't think that, that they should be able to carry slavery into the western states and territories. So sure enough, in that Chicago convention, uh, Seward's somewhat radical past on abolition comes back to haunt him, and he is not able to be nominated. And so sure enough, people come to their second love, who is Abraham Lincoln, and Lincoln receives the nomination in Chicago rather than William Henry Seward. And of course, as we all know, later makes Seward part of that team of rivals, as Doris Kearns Goodwin called it, made Seward the Secretary of State. Just like James Garfield made one of uh, the other Republican candidates for the presidency uh, in, in 1880, uh, other Republican candidates, uh, James Blaine, his Secretary of State. So not, you know, not at all un uncommon when, uh, when Garfield does it in 1880. So Lincoln becomes the Republican, vice, the Republican presidential nominee in 1860. Hannibal Hamlin of Maine is the, uh, is the vice presidential nominee. The Democratic Party splits, which is, you know, the beginning of the end for them. I mean, once you see your party splits and you've got two candidates fighting over the same, um, the same number of votes, but then you've got a unified Republican Party here, all voting for Lincoln, it's a foregone conclusion. Lincoln is going to win the presidency, really with only about 40% of the popular vote, but all of those Democratic candidates split. You know, you have Northern Democrats who run Stephen Douglas, Lincoln's old friend from Illinois, and then you have the Southern Democrats who run John C. Breckinridge, who is the sitting vice president under uh, James Buchanan. So sure enough, in early November of 1860, Abraham Lincoln uh, becomes the, uh, is elected as the 16th president of the United States. 
He and his family leave Springfield on February 11th, 1861 to go to Washington. Uh, Lincoln makes this very famous speech where he says, no one not in my situation can appreciate my feelings of sadness at this parting. Here, meaning Springfield, I have lived a quarter of a century and passed from a young to an old man. Here my children have been born and one is buried. I now leave not knowing when or whether ever I may return with a task before me greater than that which rested upon Washington. And what he's referring to, of course, is that by February of 1861, southern states had already started declaring themselves seceded from the Union. And then, of course, uh, just a few days before he shot, years, you know, four years later, Lincoln somewhat uh, prophetically remarked, Springfield, how happy I shall be four years hence to return there in peace and tranquility. And of course, we all know he didn't return to Springfield uh, until he was, he was dead. So his, he's inaugurated on March 4th of 1861. This is what I was talking about earlier. He says right in the inaugural to the South, we're not coming for your slaves. In your hands, my dissatisfied fellow countrymen, and not in mine, is the momentous issue of civil war. The government will not assail you. You can have no conflict without yourselves being the aggressors. And of course, we all know that's exactly what happens. The South fires upon Fort Sumter on April 12, 1861. Uh, and so the South does, in fact, become the aggressor. Uh, in 1862, Lincoln signs a number of pieces of legislation that have great impact on uh, what I like to think of as kind of like domestic policy, I guess, if you want to call it that, uh, creates the Department of Agriculture, passes the Homestead Act, the Pacific Railway Act, the Morrill Act, which is the creation of the land-grant college system, uh, and issues the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation in September of 1862, just after the Union victory at Antietam, which is a battle we have talked about in this series uh, in the past. On November 19, 1863, he makes what is widely considered one of the most famous speeches in human history, not just American history, uh, the Gettysburg Address. Uh, and that's, of course, where he you know, remarks about four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Um, and then closes with, we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom. And that new birth of freedom, I think, is probably the most critical phrase in that whole speech. And that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. So in, what, 262 words or so, Lincoln completely transforms what this war is really all about uh, and really makes it about not just bringing the country back together, but bringing the country back together and making it better making it live up to what it says it is. This is all about making the government, making the federal government keep its promises to in fact say that all men are created equal. And 105 years later, on the night before he's assassinated, Martin Luther King gives a speech in Memphis and he references this and says, all we're saying America is be true to what you said on paper. And that was not a new argument in 1968. It was an old argument that Lincoln had made in 1863. Lincoln, of course, runs for re-election in 1864. Uh, up until almost the time of the election, he's convinced he's going to lose. Uh, and so he's preparing to hand over the presidency to, uh, to the Democratic candidate. That, of course, doesn't happen. And in fact, you can see it's uh, uh, something of a landslide in, in 1864. By the time of this election, uh, the war is definitely going the North's way. Uh, you know, uh, Atlanta, has been uh, uh, Atlanta has been captured, Sherman's on the march to the sea. Uh, so there's a number of important Union victories that make people in the North feel this has all been worth it and we're starting to bring this thing to a close. <clears throat> and then, of course, we all know what happens. Lincoln is, uh, is assassinated just, uh, you know, about six weeks into his second term. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's, it's ironic because, of course, John Wilkes Booth, who is... Uh, from, a, you know, a well-known actor. He's from Maryland. Um, he's a Confederate sympathizer. Interestingly enough, a number of other members of his family were very, very staunch Unionists. Uh, but for some reason, uh, John Wilkes Booth is a, is a Confederate sympathizer. So he shoots Lincoln on April 14th, 1865, five days after Robert E. Lee surrenders, which is not really the end of the war, but is definitely an indication that the war is going to be over very soon and the South is going to lose. So John Wilkes Booth decides to, to kill Lincoln really to avenge the South. Uh, the other thing that Booth was upset about was that Lincoln had given a speech on April 11th uh, in which he sort of made reference to 
the possibility of, of black people being able to vote. Uh, and that really incensed John Wilkes Booth. And so he basically said, you know, that's the last speech he'll ever make. And he was right because four days later he, he, killed, he killed Lincoln. And so Booth, you know, thinks he's avenging the South. And in, in fact, if you look back in history now, I think the person who probably did more damage to the South, other than somebody like Jefferson Davis, perhaps, is John Wilkes Booth. Because Abraham Lincoln was set up to be the South's best friend in the Reconstruction era. Lincoln wanted, uh, he, had a, he had a plan uh, in place, really, to bring former Confederate states back into the Union relatively easily, to try to make Reconstruction as painless as possible for white Southerners, while also guaranteeing the civil, political rights, and physical safety of the formerly enslaved people in the South. So Lincoln wanted this, this Reconstruction period to be uh, as, as uncontroversial and as peaceful as possible for everyone, white and black. Uh, and of course, when Booth killed Lincoln, that put the presidency into the hands of Andrew Johnson. Andrew Johnson had zero interest in promoting and protecting the rights and security of, of African Americans. Uh, Andrew Johnson wanted Southerners to come back into the Union and, uh, and basically return the South to white supremacy as quickly as possible. And that's, uh, that's what happened eventually, although we did go through this period of radical Republican Reconstruction as well, when congressional Republicans were, uh, were passing laws and really managing Reconstruction in the South. And at that point, for those 10 years or so, uh, the times were okay for, for African Americans in the South. They were, they were able to buy land, they were able to get jobs, they were elected to offices. Uh, and then of course, once, uh, once uh, radical reconstruction ends, then the South reverts back to white supremacy rel relatively quickly. So, so uh, at this point, if anybody has questions, obviously this is the end of Lincoln's life and so it's the end of the program. Um, so if anybody has questions, I'm happy to try to answer any questions you might have or comments or concerns or now's the time to throw something. If you've got a coffee cup you think I really screwed up and you want to throw it at me, you know, now's the time. Yes? Does Lincoln have any known relatives today? No, there are no living descendants of Abraham Lincoln left. Um, there were some into, uh, gosh, I want to say into the seven, 1970s or 80s. But my understanding is that all of the, the Lincoln descendants have since died. Uh, the Lincolns had four sons. Only one of them, Robert Todd Lincoln, the very first son, lived you know, past his teenage years. Um, he, ha he was married and had daughters. And I believe maybe they all had, none of them had children, or maybe they had children, but then none of those children had children. So. Um, the, the line, you know, I think that was, they were down to, you know, distant cousins and things like that by the 70s or 80s. But to my knowledge, at least, there are no living descendants of Lincoln left. Contrast that with somebody like Garfield, who, you know, we have Garfields all over the place, including right here in Cleveland, which is great. We see them all the time, and it's a really cool thing to, to have those folks and to see them and to know them. Yes? Which, um, which administration um, initiated President's Day? Pres oh. National holiday? Huh. Well, you know, President's Day hasn't always been called President's Day. It used to just be called Washington's birthday. And I think, if I'm correct about this, I think technically it is the federal government still calls it that. Even today, they call it Washington's birthday. We all call it President's Day. And I should also mention, by the way, President's Day is coming up. And James A. Garfield National Historic Site will be open and free, 11 to 3, on President's Day. Um, so please come see us. Uh, when did it? When when was that declared a federal holiday? I I'm I'm not sure about that. Uh, it, but it would have been after Lincoln, certainly sometime after Lincoln, because for the longest time it was even though it was called Washington's birthday, it was intended to to mark the birthdays of both Washington. Washington's birthday was February 22nd and Lincoln February 12th. So, but when there was any kind of legislation about you know, the third Monday in February being called President's Day, I, I'm not sure about that. Easily Googleable, I guess, but I, I don't know off the top of my Nixon, head. You think it was Nixon? Okay, so a very, very, very well-informed source here tells me it may have been during the Nixon administration, so. <laughs> Maybe, but don't quote us. <laughs> her, you can quote her, not me. Anyone else, any other questions? Uh, so thank you for coming. Uh, next month is March. Thank you.